What else we got? Anybody need a, a cute CIA lapel pin? Oh, I have. Yeah, this guy's getting ready to bop me with a schmoo ball. I gotta shoot this thing right down the throat. Oh, here. I forgot to give you this. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, my, my, my oh, actually, bad. it will help because if I get the angle just right, it'll divert them all over. <laughs> Anyway, we'll wait, we'll wait for the uh, panel introductions here when the, the video and audio is ready to set up. By the way, Ted, awesome. All the stuff this guy does for us out here at all these cons. Buy his CD. Buy his DVD. <laughs> hey, quick ad. Any, anybody figure out the, uh, uh, the badge puzzle yet? No, nobody? There was a puzzle with the bag? Okay. Oh. Pay attention in this presentation. <laughs> We're live. We're good. Ted says we're live. We can go now. Say when. He said when. Oh, okay. You missed it. Ted said when. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Good afternoon. Welcome to Tough Security for Tough Times. What we got here is a panel of five people who we might happen to know what we're talking about. My name is G. Mark Hardy. I got over here Bruce Potter, Jack Holleran, Fed, extraordinaire. We got Mark McGovern. We got Peter Guerra, and we want to tell you a little bit about our insight on it. We're going to. Go I'm not a CISP. <laughs> Say again. I'm not a CISP. Are you a schmoo? Are you a schmoo? Uh, and it, well, that's. I guess if you want to acronymize schmoo, you're welcome to. Um, but I'm definitely not a CISP. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Try that with your keynote software. <laughs> 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 Bow to my PowerPoint Ranger skills. <laughs> you had to be here for Shmoo One to remember that one. Okay, what are we looking at? Are bad times good for security professionals? Well, they're not bad if you are a professional. They are bad if you're not. What do we mean by that? First of all, what makes you a professional? For some people, it's just when you go ahead and get a business card. Absent that, you can maybe go out and get a degree or finish your degree or get something that you can go ahead and point to some sort of formal education. Not that it's really a lot of value in this line of work because usually the academic community lags the real world by a few years. You got initials after your name. S-H-M-O-O, M-O-U-S-C, -O 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 -E, whatever it happens to be. <laughs> Most importantly these days, your paycheck clears the bank. Whatever you're working for, as long as you get paid, you can go ahead and take that to the bank. You don't really care about all the rest of that stuff, right? <laughs> and with apologies to Marshall McLuhan, <laughs> professional is anything you can get away with. So what's happening in the stock market these days? Okay, pretty well known, okay? Our 401 k has gone to a 301K, now to 201K, and we're heading pretty much down the toilet. Okay, your self-esteem is probably next if you tie yourself up into your net worth. Bottom line is we're not gonna go ahead and get our dot-coms to be rich by the time we're 30 anymore. But wait, there's more, because it's not quite all gloom and doom. Although we're looking at some of the major systems out there, Microsoft, Cisco, Dell, all heading down. Hey, these are stock trends, and they're starting to come back up in terms of technology. So maybe it isn't as bad as it seems in some certain sectors, because a lot of times IT security gets swept underneath the whole IT umbrella, and it doesn't get looked at individually. So we might find out we're probably in a little niche that might be able to survive the storm. So security spending can, spending can hold steady for a number of reasons. Compliance is big. If you've got to do Sarbanes-Oxley, that's huge. If you run a bank, you want to make sure you didn't get caught with your fingers in the cookie jar, so you order a Sarbanes-Oxley compliance audit. Nothing in 404 that says you need an audit, but yet the big four and a half sell millions and millions of dollars of those things every year. Uh, bad guys need more money, too, because in bad times, crime picks up. The problem is you can't really convince management of that because basically they speak a different language than we do in the technology world, but that's an entirely different presentation. But with the new administration here in Washington and all the issues that are going on with regard to all this money that's going to bail out, expect some new regulation. Regulation means compliance. Compliance means work for us. That's a good thing. And there's many existing contracts that are out there. I and mean, if you know your stuff, you're okay. Ed Scotus, where you at? Okay, one of the lessons that Ed learned, okay, make sure you don't end up with the trademark problem with the name of your corporation. <laughs> okay, what are you seeing out there in terms of the marketplace? Good, bad, level set? Pretty good. Pretty good, okay, so it's not all that bad. There are people out there that are doing well. There are some options to avoiding reality, though. You can go back to school, work on that professional thing, get that degree. But the problem is you gotta get up before noon sometimes to go ahead and make those classes. That brick and mortar tends to be a little bit annoying. Move back in with your parents. Not, right? Some of you haven't moved out from your parents yet. <laughs> okay? Start your own consulting firm. That works. Doesn't take a whole lot. A box of business card and a laptop and a little bit of chutzpah, and you're out there and you're giving it a try. And the neat thing is, by the way, if you ever want to start your own business, 
what better time to do it than if you're between jobs? Because no one's going to hold it against you if you try to pull it off. And if it does work, you're golden. Otherwise, you just hop back and you go work for somebody. Or you can apply for the job that cybersecurity czar. They can't seem to hold on to anybody in this position right here. You know, they got this help wanted sign out here out of Homeland Security. No experience with them required. So you might be able to get a Fed job. But don't lose momentum. We all know Moore's Law, right? Technology doubles 18 months. Well, I got a corollary to that, and it says half of what you know about security is going to be obsolete in 18 months. It's a little bit scary, but you think about it. Okay, who's running Vista 18 months ago? <laughs> Who wants to run it today? But more importantly, how is the, your iPhone? How old is the technology? It changes rapidly. The threats change rapidly. You've got to dedicate yourself to lifelong learning, or you're not going to be able to go ahead and master this very competitive environment that we're facing out there today. There's educational opportunities, scholarship for service. It's kind of like an ROTC in the computer security world. You go year for year, you go and you go work for a federal agency. Had a chance last month here, gave a keynote talking to about 250 students that are participating in this program. It's pretty neat. If you're working as a Fed, it's not so bad. Your checks clear the bank. You get to play offense legally and things like that. You can also go ahead and get these cool things called security clearances, which everybody tells you inside the beltway is worth at least 20% extra on your next paycheck. A lot of schools out there have an NSA-approved curriculum. Google CyberWatch, I don't want to pitch that. It's a program that I'm on the uh, directors for as well. You start to see I get involved with a lot of nonprofits and things like that, because as you get a little bit more time under your belt, start giving back. Don't just keep stuff for yourself. Hints for carbon contact with the carbon network, because you're all computer guys, right? First of all, use deodorant if you go out there on a job or interview. Um, <laughs> use some references. References are good. And make sure the references, they can be checked by an employer. Part of the problem with reference checking is sometimes it becomes sort of a self-referential, and you get an, a, a a compile error on them. You can read that hopefully quickly enough. And don't expect management to understand your skills. Because what happens is management speak one language, you speak another, and they're not necessarily even the hiring process. But the hard part is, is trying to be able to and communicate the importance of what's going wrong in the security world. Why do we need money for this? Why do we have to go that? You start talking bits, bytes, firewalls, things like that, you lost them. Total cost of ownership, litigation avoidance, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. You don't look good in orange, boss, you know, things like that. Help them understand that there's a different incentive out there. There will always be work. As long as there are stupid people out there, there will always be work. And that's backed by scientific research. You need it. I was on the outside of most of these intel boxes. And uh, Einstein says, hey, two things are infinite. Universe, human stupidity, not so sure about the former. So learn how to use Keynote, or you end up like me, as if just another PowerPoint ranger. But it wasn't all that bad. So anyway, that was kind of a quick five-minute tour through a whole bunch of slides and a whole bunch of hints, by the way, if you're paying attention. And uh, over the other panel members. Bruce? Um, yeah, so real quick, one, um, G. Mark, we're all asleep because he talks so slow. Um, <laughs> Too much caffeine, sorry. From upstate New York, right? Yeah, in upstate New York, there's like a, a test they give you when you're three that if you can't talk fast enough, they ship you to Idaho. Um, <laughs> 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 so uh, apologies to the Idahoans in the room, um, which I'm sure isn't how you not pronounce that. Um, they got big buffers, though. They're still in slide four, but they're processing. Yeah, exactly, they're processing. <laughs> um, so a uh, quick question. How many people in the room have uh, changed jobs in the last year? Okay, of those people that have raised their hands, was it an easy transition to find a new job in the security space? No. Well, that's shocking for the people that said no. Out of curiosity, how many security professionals that have already had a security job, not those looking to break into the industry, um, are currently unemployed in the room? Couple. Huh. So our unemployment rate's about um, an eighth of a percent. Um, <laughs> So out of uh, the curiosity, uh, someone who said no for the transfer of the job, what was the, what was the challenge to find a new job? Locale. Locale. Oh, so you didn't want to work in Idaho. Uh, <laughs> new Hampshire. <laughs> no one works in New Hampshire. Sir, a decode. <laughs> no problem. Work. Right, you changed kind of your functional direction that you were focused. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it, it it strikes me that um, there's still a lot of demand for these jobs. How many people out here are hiring security professionals right now? How many people are having an easy time finding qualified people for your security positions? Right, yeah, there you go. Okay, so 
um, with the right skill set, people are still highly marketable in the workforce. Um, I, G Mark, with apologies, um, a lot of that that he showed was kind of a focus on the, um, I guess, supply side of the services, if you will. Um, I think one of the things we want to talk on here, too, is a little bit some of the product side um, of the space and what's going on there. And, uh, you know, this is hopefully an open forum. So as far as ground rules go, um, Ted, do you have a wireless mic? Yeah, it's right here. Sweet. Ted's going to have the wireless mic up. So if you want to engage in the conversation, please feel free to raise your hand. And Ted will run across the room. He's <laughs> really good at it. Or someone else if he passes out. Um, but uh, anyway, those are just kind of the basics. Mark, do you have anything to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is look at products, is look at what the commercial world is trying to do that isn't inside the beltway. Uh, and some of the factors or factors that we're seeing there is, is a strong move to consumer-oriented products, um, which is very unusual in a lot of ways for what goes on, where the enterprise is deemed not spending a lot of money, but if there's any money to be bought or spent these days, it's out of consumers. I, I should say, up until November, was out of consumers. Uh, and so what you're seeing is a lot of folks who are trying to invest in those things and try to pump capital into that and staff those out, outside of the Beltway. Uh, and they have almost no concept as to the value of security or the need to staff that out until they get large enough. So the, the security draw there is really interesting because you have a lot of emerging security issues uh, and you have potentially a lot of places where security folks could have a lot of influence, uh, but you're not seeing that stressed by the people who are putting capital into the market. So um, what, I mean, from a security pr product perspective, you've seen it, though, still healthy? I mean, it, it, looking beyond the investment side of things, I mean, do you still see that the industry itself is still... For, for big companies, it's still pretty healthy. I mean, we, we do see Cisco, McAfee, Symantec, and others doing, you know, holding their market share, uh, doing uh, increasing revenue in certain things like uh, DLP, uh, where that's really taking off a lot because of compliance, a lot because the incidents are going up in the people who will spend against that in compliance. So you're still seeing a strong draw on the established products, which is good. Are you seeing, I mean, so, so compliance is one side of the equation. Um, I contend that right now we're having a pretty impressive uptick of motivated and skilled um, attack activity that are hitting people as well. Um, are you seeing that bubble up to the level where it's affecting the product space at all, or are people still got their heads down in the compliance issue? So it's a good, normally when we look at the security industry, what we see is an engine where uh, really smart security guys start product companies. Uh, the financial world is traditionally the place that picks that up the fastest and runs with it. Uh, and often you'll hear an entrepreneur say, I'm going to target three markets. I'm going to target financial, health care, and government. Uh, and we look at them and we say, well, financial will actually spend money, which isn't true today. Uh, health care is, is unlikely to spend money, which is still true today. Uh, and government is slow. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at the startups, you're looking at a lot of folks who target financials. So the engine of new innovation has got a real hard problem right now because the startups aren't getting a lot of funding when they're focusing exclusively on security and targeting financials. S s but that's a relatively recent trend. It is relatively recent since, uh, since mid last year, mid to late last year. Huh. Um, so from a consumer perspective, that's actually kind of surprising that, I mean, consumers are have been spending on security products on their own? Like this is mom going to Fred Meyer and like buying herself semantic or what is that? No, consumers don't pay for security I think in general is what we think. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they pay for products and those are the products that are being bought. You know, whether it's, uh, whether it's the online uh, services that they can subscribe to or um, you know, uh, photo management capabilities, things like that social networks, they're not quite paying for it yet, but those are the things that you're seeing gather some really interesting venture funding. Okay. Um, where there are huge, I mean, you guys know, there are huge security issues looming in sort of how do we deal with privacy, how do we deal with these issues? Uh, but there's money in those spaces right now. Right. And, and not a lot of security magnets uh, drawing in security talent yet. 
What about um, from a services perspective for anybody on the panel? I mean, what do we see from, I mean, even the people in the audience, the security services, there's gotta be more than a couple of consultants in the room. Um, and I, my, my perception, I recently, um, recently, a year and a half ago, started my own uh, company and it's just three of us, but um, you know, it's been going well. I mean, people are having problems and we get phone calls and we go help them fix their problems and it seems to be no end of that. Um, and when I was working for big corporations, it seemed like it was the same kind of thing. It just happened with a lot more decimal points. Um, so from my perspective, the services uh, industry with respect to information security is still hot. Um, and I don't know if that's because, again, there's increased activity that people are dealing with, that there's increased focus on compliance, that somehow people have started to get what the return on investment is. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I still don't think you can put a number on how valuable the security service within an organization is. Was that directed at me? Sure, I'm looking, I'm looking <laughs> through a pair of sunglasses so that everyone gets the brunt of it. <laughs> it's a Ferris Bueller moment. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> anyone? Um, so it's interesting because the, um, one of the things that uh, I've been studying with my economics professor is the impact of cybercrime, uh, which is, you know, you would hope to be the driver towards, uh, you know, people becoming, try to become more secure. Um, so my economics professor keeps talking to me about, um, you know, may you live in interesting times. And uh, we kind of came to the conclusion that 2009 will uh, definitely be an interesting time for information security professionals specifically. Um, most breaches are economically motivated these days, um, regardless if you're, if you're a government or a, co a commercial organization. Uh, 2004 marked the first time when proceeds from cybercrime uh, outpaced the proceeds from illicit drugs in the United States. Um, Where does that come from? That was from a quote from uh, the Treasury Secretary, Tricia Nivens. Uh, really? In 2005. So people are making more money by stealing money online than they are by selling coke on the street corner and running it through subs. Supposedly. 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 So obviously, you know. If I'm the director of an agency, can I make wild conjecture like that? Can someone just like appoint me to be a directorship so I can just make up some stats? So, um, <laughs> so the exact numbers are obviously never truly known, right? I mean, the illicit drug market is um, very large, is the <laughs> assumption, and they, have, they can calculate that by, uh, you know, the amount of drugs are confiscated, what the history worth is, uh, and so forth. So, right. cybercrime is even more difficult, in my opinion, to uh, to do that. However, you know, when you know we've done um, incident response jobs, and uh, you know, we know how much we charge for our services, and uh, it can be quite a significant chunk of a company's uh, revenue. So, so that's not the loss of whatever the hell happened, right? That's not the theft of the information Correct. or the whatever. That's the that's the cost of recovery. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, I mean, so, so the Kevin Mitnick issue, right, was I stole the source code for Solaris, and that's worth, question mark, you know, $100,000, 27 gajillion, you know, whatever it was that Sun came up with, you know? Right. Um, what about putting a number on the actual, you know, loss? I mean, there's, so there's loss of the, the, the intellectual property, and then there's loss of the actual capital directly. Well, I'm, I was assuming when she was uh, speaking that that was probably also lumped in. And that's probably part of the reason why it was so much. Because, I mean, you can see in the um, marketplace right now, it's very difficult to say how much your intellectual capital is really worth down to the penny. Right. I mean, you can estimate how much you'd be able to make in terms of profits over time, but you can't necessarily say, well, you know, that idea is worth $100. You know, it's very difficult. But you are seeing actual theft. Yes. I mean, the financial guys are seeing, you know, the, yes, the, that the is theft one out of accounts and... Uh, Yes, so I mean, so in the financial industry, um, where people are actually stealing money from them, they can obviously put a very fine number on exactly, you know, what their losses are. They can do some calculations for productivity loss and so forth. Yeah. So, um, but one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things that we were kind of looking at was, you know, kind of the, there's good news and bad news, right? I mean, with that, the, the good news is, you know, in the press, and partially because we believe of uh, breach notification laws and some other things, you know, there's never been a higher um, interest or knowledge of information security, right? I mean, it, it, today you, you hear about people wanting to do cybersecurity czar or, you know, that such. And, you know, maybe five, ten years ago you wouldn't have maybe necessarily heard of that um, in as much of a forefront as you see it today. Um, and there are some government initiatives that we looked at, specifically CNCI, that is attempting to put money uh, towards that in the government space. Could you expand that acronym to something meaningful? That is um, the, uh, yeah, I can't uh, No, ah, yeah. anyone? 
Comprehensive National Cybersecurity right. Initiative. Woohoo! Thank you. All right. So well, the details of which are, um, you know, not available to the public, unfortunately, but um, it is a significant chunk of money to try and address, you know, a lot of the government's issues. But that doesn't necessarily um, transfer over, obviously, to the commercial space. You know, there's uh, right. companies who have to operate every day, and uh, the global recession, because we're in a global recession and a global economy, uh, two things um, that are detrimental to commercial corporations right now, they're looking very heavily at what their expenditures are going to be, specifically overhead expenditures, which is typically what information security falls under. So, so we have this interesting trend. Let me just, right. I'll com complete. Okay. Um, we have this interesting trend that, you know, awareness of information security issues might be high. Um, there is definitely probably going to be an increase in uh, cyber crime this year, uh, mostly because people who are connected and skilled will be out of a job in current industrialized and uh, emerging markets, and uh, th yet most places will not have the capital needed to actually be able to address those problems. So that, that's kind of where the interesting times uh, we were talking about comes from. Right. So it, it's interesting because I've been spending a lot of my time dealing with organizations um, after they've had some incident and they're trying to, you know, clean up from that. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to look at the value of security when it comes to the overall, um, you know, the overall IT organization, right? IT had for years, um, you know, the CIOs have tried to make this claim that IT is an enabler of an enterprise's uh, mission, right? Like if I do IT better and I'm General Motors, that means I build cars more efficiently and better than Ford, right? And the better my IT system's in, they're so tightly integrated with my day-to-day -day processes that the, there's a direct return on investment that says, if I do this better, I'm a better company for it. Um, IT security is a stretch, right? If I have better firewalls and smarter security professionals, does that mean I build better cars? Or er, no, maybe it means Ford doesn't build the same cars that I'm building, because uh, they're not able to steal the plans for them. Um, but it, it's, it's really hard to draw a return on investment. When you start to say, well, I think people are breaking into our network and we need to go look for them, question mark, and we're going to hire this really smart guy and a, buy a bunch of software, and that somehow is going to make an important difference in how we build cars. And we can't really measure the success of how good they do, and we really don't know what they're doing, but we, damn it, it's important that we do this because we're security people and we pound on tables a lot. Um, it's really hard to connect all those dots in a recession and say, yes, absolutely, that is a required spend. Um, in organizations that have obviously hemorrhaged something, you know, it's left the organization, like, whoops, we got compromised. We'll spend money to go back and fix that for about a year. And then we close the door again because we spent that money and we couldn't demonstrate how important it was to have spent that capital. Yeah, so it's even worse now because the, a lot of companies are operating on such razor thin margins that they don't even have that capital, nor can they borrow that capital to actually be able to address when a compromise happens. Yeah, when you look at return on investment, the problem is, is that you go in for your budgetary review and they said, hey, well, last year we gave you $600,000 for security and nothing happened. So why should we give you any money next year? Because uh, nothing happened. But the problem is trying to correlate what a return on investment, which is an actuarial model, which doesn't work for security, is compared to an ROSI, return on security investment, is more along the lines of, you know, why do you have life insurance? I mean, think about it. If you buy life insurance, the agent is betting you're going to live, and you're paying the money to bet he's wrong. Okay, well, it's logic in that, and yet we do it. Why? Because we're thinking of something more permanent than just that financial transaction to provide the security. So part of the challenge you're going to face out there, particularly if you're either trying to justify yourself to get hired into an organization that has few or no security professionals, or if you are the lone security professional they're fighting for your budget, is to be able to translate your arguments into executive language that they understand. Something that lets them see that their competitive advantage, that business processor, for example, of making cars, is a core key element of their competitive nature and their competitive ability to do business. And without that, they're going to lose that. And if it's not core to their process, don't protect it. Don't guard the trash cans. Guard the good stuff. OK, let me translate that down a little bit to the people down in the trenches. You've got to be able to make a business case. Security is an overhead. Overhead says we're taking it out of profit. What does profit go to in most com companies? Anybody from the audience? I play teacher. Shareholders. Shareholders. Who else? Management bonuses. Now, I'm a manager. Do I want to pay the bonus or do I want to buy security? If I bypass the security cost, the impact's not going to hit me for three to five years. I'm going to be in a new job. It's next person's problem. 
So one of the things as a security professional, you need to understand the business case. You need to understand more aspects beyond the technical domain of watching that firewall. You need to take a look at where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10? Where do I want to be in 20? Now I realize that, you know, that's kind of hard. I mean, I worked at a TLA for over 30 years. I went from the uh, basement to the boardroom. TLA, Jack, for the uninitiated. If they're that dumb. <laughs> Don't ever insult your audience. Free letter agency. Okay, but uh, I had fun there. I was in Toyville. I was directly responsible for a lot of the computer security solutions for 15 years. The first 10 probably because I was the cause of the problem. And then I evolved into going into computer security. I can say that I was one of the first 100 people in the field of computer security. That's not something a lot of people can say. And I had fun with it. I still do. I like doing new blood. Like I, I, we got together for a meeting. He says, oh, you taught me my SysOp class. I had one guy, he was in my sophomore class for hardening networks. I mean, I have fun bringing new blood, getting them interested in these things. So speaking of new blood, the, um, and, and teaching, um, how many folks have gone back for uh, uh, higher education and higher learning uh, formally for information security? How many of you people are outside the DC area? That went in for the formal education, sorry. Uh, I, we can do that all over again. Hey, you didn't say Simon Says. Uh, yeah, Simon Says, how many people outside the DC area went back for formal education in computer security? Okay, that's not a bad number. Um, you know, I, I, it's certainly been my experience in the last few years that um, between the DOD mandate for 8570 that all IA coded jobs have to have an IA something or other associated with a name that I had him removed, um, and, and so that's forcing people to get certs. Um, and there's also a perception that if I get the um, you know, master's degree in information assurance or something like that, that that's going to make me more marketable and that kind of thing. Um, I dropped out of college. Um, I went to school for a long time, but I eventually dropped out and never got my degree. But I still have a lot of faith in the educational system as a whole and the diligence it teaches you as far as what you need to go through. But I'm not still convinced of the value in the marketplace of the kind of continued learning that's going on at some of these institutions and their impact on, um, you know, A, the overall security of the enterprise and B, someone's marketability. I mean, have people found that their higher education has gotten them more marketable since they got their master's or whatever in information assurance? Branson, this will be a challenge. So, so yeah. Branson says, if, you, you, oh, if you're Horace, don't try to address the whole audience. <laughs> we'll, we'll repeat it. <laughs> Branson, Branson had a tragic accident, lost his voice. Um, the uh, uh, his statement was that when it's the, you're speaking with the government uh, or when you're dealing with the government, that uh, it makes a big difference. Um, and I guess the the corollary to that was maybe outside the government, it doesn't make as big a difference. <laughs> Got a hand, sir. So, and that's for most government contracts. So. So, so from his experience, most government contracts will base your pay on experience and your, your education level. Uh, sorry, point. your point, I can't see squat. There's one back by the light. I've had CISPs come up and tell me, hey, I'm, I got my CISP, but I'd actually like to do some security work. <laughs> what, what, what I found out is that if you don't know what CISSP means, it means nothing to you. And if you really understand what CISSP means, it means nothing to you. But <laughs> if you want to impress somebody who wants to pretend that they think they know what they're talking about, it's very useful. <laughs> so, you, you know, there's this whole push right now to, to you know, a, as people are getting laid off and, they're ha and everyone's afraid of their job, even if they're not getting laid off, they're running back to continued education. 
right? Like Strayer University has more advertising per minute now than I think they've ever had, right? I mean, all these uh, Strayer and Phoenix and all these people are advertising like crazy for everything. It's not security. I mean, they're, they're advertising for nursing and whatever else. And people are trying to go back to school to make themselves more marketable in the, in the, the marketplace. I've kind of had the contention that while it's great for electrical engineering and mechanical engineering because gravity is the same that it's been for a long time and so is electricity, um, you know, computer security isn't the same, you know, to, to G Mark's point, you know, there, there's a half life to this knowledge and, you know, does that education really matter or am I looking for as a, from a hiring perspective, someone who's actually engaged in the community and actually doing work? Um, sir, hand. Okay, thanks. Um, I used to work for a three-letter company, and <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they told me that they wouldn't pay me to uh, get my education. I had to pay for it myself. Um, they paid me, they paid for my test for my certification, uh, but that was the extent of it because I already had a uh, security job. So they didn't figure they had to enhance that. That's why I don't work there anymore. Um, but I think a lot of it is because the government says we have this requirement and corporations can charge the government more money if they show a certain number of certs on their payroll. And uh, so I think this whole thing is all government motivated. Are you a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> yes. The thing I'd like to reflect on having the uh, credential, okay, if you're fearing being laid off or are laid off, you should be spending time networking. You should be selling yourself. You should be marketing yourself. Not in your company. Join the ISSA. Join InfraGuard. Go to ShmooCon. Sit in the corner. Right? Raise a flag with a question. You know. But what you need to do is network and find other people that you can discuss things with so that they understand your strengths. You also, as a corollary, know their strengths so that if you're a shortfall, you can pick them up. I have a friend here today. He says he's having trouble. He needs to find 15 people in security with a TSSCI clearance um, this week. <laughs> now, now, the problem is there's only a few. You know, when you take a look at the percentages. I can't comment on outside of the D.C. area, but realistically, in the job market in D.C., you need a clearance second. You need networking first. Certifications third. Education fourth. If you have the network, say again? <laughs> yeah. No, there's not. Did you say competence or confidence? No, forget the confidence. Uh, forget the competence. A lot of places hire people that have a ticket without having competence. I've worked with a lot of them, and I've used social engineering to get Anybody rid of them. Anybody ever vote for one? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but so, realistically, you need to do the networking. You, if you're not doing networking now, when you're in a nice, secure job, you're in trouble. Uh, a lot of people are saying they've been out of work for a while, okay? I think in the last 20 years, even inside my TLA, I have not actively pursued one job. I've never had to submit a resume other than, can you come in and talk to us and while you're here, bring a resume. I've been in three jobs since I've retired. I've never asked for an opportunity to go get a job. Someone said, I think we can use your skill set. Why don't you come on down and visit us? Of course, each time I went, the salary uh, requirements went up three to five percent. I'm I'm not disagreeing, but I'm talking about yeah. what happened in the last eight years. It's a new world, and everybody better wake up to the fact that. Uh, as technology improves, security improves, and as businesses downsize on a continuous basis and learn to fight, le to, to live, they're going to live leaner and meaner, there's going to be a lot less opportunity than there were just a year ago. 
But this is why I say you as a security professional must understand the business. I, I'd like to follow up on that actually. So yeah. I think on the, on, the, on the outside the beltway, yeah. uh, what we see a lot, and we, when we talk to folks, when we're looking at you know, small companies, are we looking for talent? What we find is that the security guys almost always, if they've got one, he's described as that smart guy who knows the right things to do for us. And that's a lot, when you watch how they, how, how that dynamic works in a small company or an emerging company, it turns into somebody uh, who knows what they're trying to do as a business. He's very visible. Uh, he makes his value known on some fairly recurring manner. I mean, all the things that you'll find a good consultant will do in a lot of ways. Um, but they're doing it and they are networking not only outside of their organization but inside. Uh, and, they're, and it's really very interesting to look at them where they will often fence off their jobs to be, well, my job is security, but people will go to them for all sorts of interesting questions like what are the, what are the demographics of our customers and how, do we, how often do we do things and what sort of nature is, you know, all these business intelligence things that are, if there was money on, on Wall Street in the commercial world would be taking off really. Uh, but they're often asking the security guys because the security guys know the ins and outs. They pay, you pay so much attention to the details that you become the guy who's essential to what the heck's going on. Uh, and that's an aspect not to lose because that's why people get rehired to company to company to company is they, they're deemed smart and useful, not just the security guy. Mark, let me just add a little thought here. There's a lot of times we've seen over the years that in IT shops, we tend to have a little bit of an arrogance, not just in security, but they say, hey, we're the center of the universe, we're the center of gravity for our companies. And no. the answer is, <laughs> no, you're probably not. And then, as, he, as Mark was saying, do you understand the business process of the organization for whom you work, or your client, if you're a consultant? Because if your whole world ends at the end of the, you know, the silicon network and you can look at the bits and bytes, but you don't know what that translates into in the real world, you're at a severe disadvantage in the workforce because you may have technical skills, but your business awareness skills are lacking and that could cause your downfall in a marketplace. So we'll let you use the microphone. Oh, I, I didn't quite hear that guy's question, so I don't know if I'm stepping on him uh, and changing. But uh, there's one problem with that strategy of understanding the overall business. If you've proven that at other companies, just went through interviewing process this fall, you've proven that at other companies. You've shown you've been part of the business end to end and dealt with IT and security as, a, you know, I, I, as this end to end thing. Then they turn around and go, hey, uh, where's your CISSP and where's your, uh, oh yeah, here's a bunch of esoteric you know, technical things about our environment that you could look up in like 30 seconds on a man page or something. But you're, 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 you're dealing on a level that can actually be threatening and get you out of the job. Um, that's just, uh, just as an aside, like how do we change some of these deeper ideological problems in the way people go about hiring smart people or creative people? This is where you have to educate management. This is number two Why on the list. No. This is, it, well, yes, even in the interview, you need to educate management as to why certain things are important. I'm trying to think. Uh, Sandy yeah, gave a talk yesterday in one of the uh, education uh, forums, and she was basically saying, let's communicate, let's do certain things. If you're not communicating, if you're not tasking management to give you the resources to do your job, then you're setting yourself up. Uh, like I teach a class, I tell people, you know, turn off your cell phones. If you're that important that you have to interrupt what you're doing to answer phones and answer problems, you're not promotable. For the simple reason, why would I promote you out of the position where I depend on you? So, um, as far as educating management, um, I've seen that there's 
a phenomenal difference in the level of sophistication and the understanding of uh, security and the impact on the organization throughout management in different places. There are some places that are going to check every regulatory box and that's all they really care about. There's places where the IT leadership is really clued in and they care about security as an integral part and they're going to pay a lot of attention to it. Um, I find that that's almost something, from my experience, that almost never comes from a grassroots effort where the, the security guy has the cape and the big S um, for super security, that'd be two, I like alliteration. Um, and you know, it, it comes from the fact that someone got owned or something really bad happened once or I worked at a bank and I was a manager there and we had huge fraud problems and now I'm at wherever and I'm gonna make sure that doesn't happen here. You know, the executives that are clued into security um, oftentimes learn it by trial by fire um, from the adversary and then they put that into their management process. Um, and I think that tends to resonate longer than educating them. Like, e obviously, you can't educate them in the, um, in the interview process. And usually, if you're hitting that wall at the interview process, I think it's, you know, pull the handles, leave the, leave the carcass in the ocean, and uh, go try it again somewhere else. So um, I, I really think, I, and again, this is just my experience, but the only way people learn at a high level the impact of security at a broad scale on the enterprise is to get compromised. Um, I, I think that we have spent that bullet of security is important, security is important, security is important. We've been saying it for how long? And we're fighting the same damn demons today that we've been fighting for 20 years, right? You have the same goddamn argument with the same goddamn business unit every week. Oh, we want to deploy this product. Hey, it's woefully insecure. It's bullshit. You can't do it. Pound on the table. Hey, you know what? It's going to make us a lot of money. Anyone? Anyone? That's what we're going to do. We're going to make a lot of money. Go screw yourself, security guy. Um, we've, all, we've had that conversation, right? Yeah, hell yeah, that's the way it goes down every day. You know what? And, and I, I hate it, but the most beautiful thing in the world is when that thing gets owned, yeah, <laughs> things change. Um, and they change um, culturally in the organization. It's not a technology change that happens at that point. It's not a, we're going to go buy some stuff. Surely, you do buy things. You'll buy DLP products or whatever the latest thing is that people want to buy. But suddenly, you have executive vice presidents in your office asking questions and you're scared out of your mind because the guy's got a suit on um, and you're wondering, <laughs> I wore a suit for a while, um, you know, you're, you're, you're wondering like, holy cow, what did I do to get all this attention? You didn't do squat. You know, someone somewhere else did something and now you're feeling the brunt of it, but culturally now the executive team is keyed into security and that's what they're going to give a shit about from that point forward. So Bruce, thanks for giving your, your freak Nick talk again. Uh, here at ShmooCon, we really appreciate that. Second of all, I think the big problem, the big problem is security is this thing, right? No, yeah, no, no, no. So look, 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 here, here, here's my thing. You're numbering the company quarterly, right? And so now it's like minute by minute, right? It's like, oh God, our stock price dropped. We have to unload 4,000 people, right? So you've got this P&L thing that's going on all the time. And where is security? It's just a big L, right? And it's the same cover. We need security, we need security, we need security, but we need software that works. We need software that works, we need software that works. And we, I've been singing that tune for 137 fucking years. So you gotta get in line, right? So it's like, well, first the software has to work and it has to be predictable and reproducible and you know, we have to be a CMM not negative 430. You know, a CMM two would be great. You know, so that's, you know, the, so the superficial problems with, oh, I can't get security in the organization are completely masked by the fundamental problems, which is the fact that businesses are, are not designed, it's not in the DNA of businesses at all, the way they're numbered, the way they're driven. I think that corporate security is a, gonna, is a sham. It's gonna be a sham forever until we change how we number businesses, until it's no longer, how is this business doing right now? How is this business doing right now? Until we start numbering businesses like we used to, back in the day when they were successful, 30 years, 40 years, that's when security is going to be important because that's, you can't, you can't, security has no value minute by minute. Security has value over the, uh, the, the duration, the reputation of the company. So until you start valuing your company long term, security, and I know that there hasn't been a lot of layoffs in this field just yet, but it's coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so, I'd um, like to respond in one sense that this is more. This is more for the individuals. We're here to figure out what we do to save our jobs, okay? As a professional, you should be feeding information to up above. How many people have, you know, looked at a senior's calendar 
found out when they were going to a meeting, just happened to bump into them at the door when they were leaving and walked them to their car and gave them the 30 minute or 30 second pitch to at least get an idea across. How many have taken data and passed it up the chain? Yeah, right. If you can't communicate, then you're out of luck. I mean, that's something you have to grow. <laughs> oh, okay. Here, I'm going to make a suggestion. We will tash Mr. Schmoo to have a session next year to talk about how to grow the person. We've got about five minutes left in the window that we've got for this before we set up for the final session. So I'm going to let's sweep around the panel, then we've got a minute or two left. We'll go back to questions. We're also going to hang around and answer questions offline. So let me go down here and uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Um, so this has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, I'm in an MBA program, so I tend to look at things, I think, um, and, uh, but I'm also an information security professional. So I kind of have been looking at things on both sides. And, um, you know, to Al's point uh, about uh, companies, you know, it's always in a free market system, it's always going to be about your profits for your shareholders. I mean, there's no getting around that. I think what we're really going to see, though, with this recession is that most companies now are not going to be able to bear the brunt of a compromise. They're not going to be able to pay for any remediation type of things they're going to have to do. And most likely, they're going to try and sweep it under the carpet or try to um, you know, somehow work around those types of issues. So, you know, we're always going to have a, a situation, I think, where, um, you know, kind of the, the information security professionals, the geeks or so forth, they're saying, you know, we need these technical controls, and you have the you know, business that has another idea of exactly, exactly what they want to spend on. So, but I think, it's, um, I think it's been a really great conversation so far. Mark? So, um, to follow on to that, I have... Uh, a great belief that there's an obvious demand for security talent, uh, security talent that can relate to the business, and part of that is being driven by the fact that the opponents are becoming smarter to what motivates the businesses to take action mm -hmm. and are now actively remaining under the radar, uh, nickel and diming out millions of dollars, uh, doing things low and slow, being evasive, uh, and using resources that there's no single obvious way that an, even an enterprise or a financial institution or even the government can put in place something that stops it or protects those resources that they're leveraging. Those dynamics cover, coupled with the implosion we've had on the economy, I'm sorry, where the uh, where the normal funding of innovation would come out of the financial world and world Wall Street, really, uh, is a real issue. Yeah. So there's a huge demanding need. People see it. The financial community sees it. Uh, I, I meet with them regularly, right? And they say, I've got this problem. If I had a solution to this, I'd pay for it today, whether I was forced to via compliance or not. Because if you read the Wall Street um, uh, public uh, reporting these days, and you read it real close, you'll find they're reporting a lot of losses to cyber loss. So it's there, they see it, they can't figure out how to stop it. Uh, and the question is, what becomes of it for us as an industry? Where do we as carbon-based beings uh, fix this? I think you've got a network. You may disagree with some of the things I've said. I was in a session yesterday, one person wanted to listen to Dead Attic. Dead Attic had some you know, points that I thought needed corrected, but, you know, you need to hear why people disagree. Networking will help you. Have the dialogue. Get the learning. Get the tickets in an area. Find out what the company is. Do social engineering. You know, you want to go work for that bank. Go do some uh, Google searching on what does that bank do? What can they do? Where is that person involved in? You know, once again, that 30-second walk, maybe you'll catch that manager coming out of uh, a dinner for the local Department of Commerce or whatever, and you can give him a pitch then. That way you have an introduction to the company when you go in to interview. Network with us when we're done today. Get ideas. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, first of all, I, I agree with the networking point. You, you got to, uh, although 
we may be speaking to the choir a little bit today because it's Sunday, and again, I contend that y you define geekdom when you're at a hacker conference on a Sunday in D.C. <laughs> um, but to Mark's point, I, I wholeheartedly agree that in the near term, there is no stopping people that are motivated to break into any given enterprise. None. Nothing that you can buy today off the shelf and realistically deploy without trying to gouge out your eyeballs is, you, you, there's no way to stop them, right? I mean, you're living it in the trenches. The guys that are applauding have been there. They're, they're defending right now. Um, I, I think that the next big emphasis that we have to focus on, besides refiguring out the defense from the ground up, is figuring out how to find the bad guys when they're inside. And, and I know I'm a broken record on that, but I'm all about detection right now. Early detection. If we can't stop them, find them as soon as they hit the ground and get them the hell out so that they don't own all 10,000 systems inside your enterprise. They only own one, right? The challenge is, from a product perspective and from a services perspective, it's incredibly hard to put a value on that activity. Because if I go and look around a network for a year and I don't find an adversary or I find one or two, is that meaningful? Did I find the other 99 that we don't know are there? How good of a job did I do? I have no idea. So we're at this weird crossroads where there's less money in the system to spend on it, but from a technology and the real world perspective, we're more dire than ever. So I think there's a huge opportunity for everybody in the audience and for a lot of the product companies, but it's not gonna be doing the same shit we've been doing for the last 20 years. That's yeah. a good thought. And think Absolutely. again also, why are you doing information security? Is it because some high school career counselor sat you down and said, hmm, you're basically uncoordinated and you have no social skills. I think you ought to go into information security. <laughs> <laughs> no, we picked this stuff. Okay, yeah, all right. But for the rest of us, we got into it because it was something you found that you were really good at. Well, what made you really good at that was your intelligence, your ability to look at and solve problems from outside the box. Those same skills can be used in other areas of the economy. If one area goes down, the other one comes back. And so as we do kind of whack-a-mole through the economy and we try to go ahead and shore up different things with financial bailouts, you might find out that the very intellectual skills that made you successful where you are here can make you successful in other places. So be willing to expand your horizons a little bit because you've got the most valuable job asset out there. And it's not a credential, and it's not a certificate, and it's not a degree. It's what you got up here. And make sure that you put it to use effectively. Burgers with McDonald's. Go Nico! Ooh, yeah. yeah! So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this thing. Uh, I'll make the slides available. Now you know why I talk so fast, so we can listen to these smart people here as well. All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're we're, we're gonna uh, we're gonna take a five minute breather and retool. Um, real quick, I actually want to mention something about these closing talks. The last couple of years, we've taken random people and glued them together and tried to do a panel that sometimes is successful and sometimes is not. Uh, I think this year was successful, and I'm happy for it. If you all have suggestions on uh, things that you'd like to get five random folks on stage and have discussed for next year, feel free to send them in. Um, I lost and found. I lost and found. <laughs> She's, no, what is it? I, oh. <laughs> We'll give that to Heidi. Um, it's, anyway, if you have suggestions, I'm all the clumps. Um, if you have suggestions, please send it to us. Um, uh, we're open for whatever you guys want to hear or have for this closing plenary. And this is lost and found too. If you want someone else's quick silver hat, you're welcome to have it. Um, all right, see you in five. Thank you, gentlemen. Good stuff. Yeah, you know, I don't normally talk as fast. I just no, did not want to. I didn't want to eat up the presentation on a PowerPoint. And, and just